Amen. Let's go back over to Luke 23. And I won't spend a lot of time on it. Because we talked about it in the previous message. So we'll just use this again as a springboard to get going. Luke chapter 23 and verse 23, it says, And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Their will. Does God allow for the will of man? We found that Christ is obedient to the cross. He was obedient to the Father. But he also became obedient in the hands of wicked men who crucified and slain the Lord, according to Acts 2.23. We notice they required death to the righteous. In other words, anything but Christ will do for a man to satisfy himself uh, with his idea of God. And then we found that they desired the world's view of Christ, um, not someone who is holy and just, but someone who is like them. Amen. And then we have found that he allowed for their will. And that was the means for God carrying out his perfect will. And uh, so the question was asked last time, did God bow down to their will? Well, no. What he did instead was he allowed their will and he included their will and he used it to work out unto his own glory and purposes. We saw where the Bible gives choices to men to look and live, to choose life, to walk in the Spirit, and so on. And it means that God's sovereign laws and purposes will always end up working for His glory because He knows the end from the beginning. We ask the question, are we puppets? No. Are we left alone to, to our own devices to figure it out? No, neither one. He allows for our choices, but His laws and purposes will always prevail, i.e., Reaping and sowing. You sow something, you reap the same. Amen. That's God's law. That's His outcome and it glorifies Him. We also address Proverbs 16 and verse 4. The Lord hath made all things for Himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. And it's just simply the use that God makes for His creation, not the decisions He makes for it. It's nowhere in there. Uh, I mean, we found that He's the author of all creation, and there's one end to creation, and that is to glorify Himself. God mentions one thing there in that verse, and that's the wicked, and He uses it to prove He'll bring about His purpose, which is the day of evil. Um, God does not make a wicked man, but causes the wicked to subserve to His own glory and purposes, we found. So... We found that also that salvation is available for every man, but is only appropriated to those who truly repent and believe. It has nothing to do with being chosen beforehand to go to heaven or chosen beforehand to be hated of God, rejected of God, and sent to hell. Now, that was the introduction. Let's get to the body of this thing. And um, I just want to say that to accept Calvinism in its truest form, or actually I believe in any form, to accept Calvinism, one must participate in what is called theological term switching. Theological term switching. I first heard that phrase in Bible college 4,000 years ago, whenever, and um, it applied to cults, the cultic practice of changing the meanings of words. You manipulate the terminology to focus on semantics instead of doctrine. I heard that from Kingdom of the Cults. Um, the author used that phrase, theological term switching. Well, it applies also to the Calvinist. And so I want to give you some examples here, and then we'll have lunch. Amen. So the first thing I want to show you in this theological term switching, um, they either have to switch the meanings of things, or they have to add to the meaning of it. The first one is that the elect in the Bible is not the elect 
biblically speaking, it is the elite. It is the elite. Those who have been chosen of God, created to come to heaven and to please God and to be <coughs> saved because He loved them before He created them. But then others He created and hated them before He created them. Um, that makes absolutely no sense to me when you just read the flow of the Bible. It comes nowhere close to the truth. I want to tell you that's the spirit of the world. Elitism is the spirit of the world. It's as our brother said during the break, it's like evolution. You know, it's like he's choosing the most evolved Christians. That is the spirit of the world. Um, we think of things like the Illuminati the, or the Illumined Ones. They're smarter than everyone. They're better than everyone. They came through higher breeding than everyone. You think about royalty and governments all through breeding and, and how they have special favor from God, if they even believe in God. I think about the Sanhedrin that are the ones that took Christ to task and, and had a mock trial against Him. They were self-appointed zealots of their own religion. They were the elite. Anything else uh, below them was a sinner. Amen. They couldn't defile themselves in the common markets because they were better than everybody else. When you think about all the degrees in the world, it, it, it's crazy how we've gone to uh, people having to have degrees, certifications. But when it comes to common sense and not qualification, but, but ability and experience, that's all thrown out the, the, the door now, all out the window. Uh, for a degree. We want the elite. We want the best. For our pastor, we want doctor so-and-so. That's the spirit of the world. Amen. Um, but when you look at the word elect in the word of God, if you want to use the concordance or you can use the dictionary. And I, of course, I recommend the um, 1828 Webster Dictionary. It's the closest to the King James language. And elect literally means that which is picked out or chosen. Hmm, picked out or chosen. And I think, okay, well, how in the world did God choose me? Am I one of these elect or actually elite that God loved? And what was so special about my creation versus the one that God created to hate? How was I picked out or how was I chosen? Amen. Well, the Bible has the answer. Again, remember last time, you know, we, we kind of jumped on the phrase the Calvinist likes to use is, well, God uses means, but sometimes <coughs> he works outside of those means. And I agree with that. Uh, however, that is listed in the word of God. We find it in the Bible. We don't just go to oblivion so that we can prove our pretenses, amen, and our false beliefs. But we go to the Bible, and the Bible says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 2, to this church there that Peter was writing, it says that they were elect, now watch this, according to the foreknowledge of God. They were elect because God knew they'd get saved, is what that means. Now, uh, Calvinists can argue all day long and say, well, according to foreknowledge, he knew who he was going to love and he knew who he was going to hate. Boy, that seems like a circular argument. We'd stand there all day, couldn't we? And we could use scriptures to back it up, but let me read the whole verse. It says that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. It means God knew ahead of time. Then it says, through, through the sanctification of the Spirit. That salvation didn't come because God forechose it. It had to come through the Spirit. That salvation came as God foreknew it, as the Bible says, through the Spirit calling one to repentance. And then watch this, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That no one was chosen to be saved. That choosing is through the Spirit to Jesus Christ. He chooses by His foreknowledge. He knew who would come uh, through the Spirit, through repentance and faith, and be washed in the blood. Just read the whole verse. It's more than just Him saving somebody ahead of time. Watch this. Turn with me if you would. Go to Second Peter. 
I want to point something out here that for these people that think that there's an elite that um, God chose to love, and then there's those that are not elite that God chose to hate. I want you to notice something here. In 2 Peter, the same guy that wrote 1 Peter that we just read from that said we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God um, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. None of that happened until it happened. Amen. God just knew ahead of time it was going to happen. But 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 says, Wherefore the rather brethren Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fail. Now, if you were chosen, and you see the word election in there and calling. We, we talked about calling in the, in the morning service. I won't address that now. But see the word election in there? Make your election sure. Okay, I've got a question about that. How can I... If I was already chosen before the foundation of the world to be loved and to be saved by Christ, how can I make my election sure? How do I have that ability at all? Right? Right. If I, I was predestined to be saved, God found me, He loved me, He created me to love me and to take me to heaven, how in the world am I going to make my election sure? I can't. Yeah. Agreed? I can't. Man. I really can't. I just have to believe it's so. So now the Word of God is in conflict. Well, where do we go then? To the Word of God. Well, God works outside of means sometimes. <laughs> but when the Word of God clearly says something, you've got to go with the Bible. You can't just go with whatever dream you made up. Amen. So elect, this theological term switching, elect really means elite. It means they were created special above others. I don't get that. I, I just don't understand how they can hold to that. They say, well, you know, God works in mysterious ways. Quit going into oblivion so you can hold on to your pretense. Go to the Word of God and let it form your knowledge. Amen. And you know what I found for most Calvinists? Well, anyway, I won't, I won't go there yet. So in this theological term switching, elect or chosen becomes elite or special. That, that's what it really is. The second thing I'd like to point to you is that foreknowledge, foreknowledge, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, foreknowledge really is predestination. If I have foreknowledge of something, like I know tomorrow I have an appointment uh, that I'm going to be seeing a person in my office at a certain time, I have foreknowledge of that. Does that mean I predetermined it? No. It just means I know about it. But it means predestination. Now, in Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. And see, boy, they like that. See, He foreknew me, which foreknowledge to them means preference. Uh, he foreknew me as one He loved, as the elect, as the what we found to be really the elite. He says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. But they don't read any further. The sentence continues. There's not even punctuation after the word predestinate. And let me read it to you. For whom He did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now that's a definite predestination. He knew. He knew before He ever created uh, heaven and earth, He knew when you would be saved. He knew who you would be and who your parents were. 
He knows your genealogy. He knows every blood cell in your body. He knows everything that you've ever, every memory you have, every thought you've had. He knew all about it and He knew that you'd get saved. He knew that you would answer the call of the Spirit as the Spirit reproved the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment and that you'd be saved. And when you got saved, that means you were chosen of God because you were led of the Spirit and came through the blood. That makes you elect. That makes you chosen. I only choose those to be with me who have been washed in the blood. Amen. It's real simple. But He predestinated all of us in this room for what? Salvation? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that He predestinated us or predestined us to be uh, conformed to the image of His Son. In other words, it's a done deal. When you get saved, you get in God's family, you get in God's improvement program. Amen. And He takes you through the doctrine of sanctification. He takes you from, from plane to plane, from level to level, to where you're more and more like God. And we look for the resurrection where we will be like Him and we'll see Him as He is. Yeah. We are to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the predestination. You don't find the word anywhere else. Does it not appeal to pride? To think that you're the elite? And people try to be humble and say, well, I don't know why He would have chosen me. Listen, He didn't. I'm telling you, this doctrine is just rampant and it's... Its, its tentacles are just going through not only Christianity, but, but Baptist churches. I can't tell you how many funerals I've been to and they act like uh, the person that was killed in a car accident or died of cancer, they almost act like God gave it to them. Yeah. What? Yeah. Man, you're crazy. You mean to tell me God would take a man, get him drunk, put him in a car, put him on the wrong side of an eight-lane um, uh, limited access speedway and have him going the wrong way with his lights off so that he could hit a family head on and kill the family? Is that, is that your God? No wonder the atheists hate Christianity if that's what you think. Yeah. No, I want to tell you what happened. That idiot, that sinful idiot got drunk and he got so blinded drunk he ended up on the wrong side of the road and he killed somebody. Right. That's what it is. You say, well, God's in sovereign. He's in control. I want to tell you something. I, I feel sorry for you. I mean, if, if you get cancer, is that, is that your answer? Well, it was the design of God. Yeah, exactly. What? How about the fact that you ate Twinkies and McDonald's your whole life? Right. How about that? How, can it be that? Well, it was God's design, so He designed it for you to eat garbage so that you could get cancer. Right. You, you see where I'm going with that? The, we had a guy that finally left our church. He was coming uh, to visit, and I wouldn't baptize him because he was a Calvinist. And finally, one day, right in the middle of everything, he stood up and said, Take me home. If you ain't going to baptize me in this church, I don't want to be here. And I said, Well, if you ain't going to uh, convert from Calvinism, I don't want you here. Right. Amen. You're not going to come in. I mean, he believed everything. If he tripped over the rug on the way to the dining room, he'd say, well, thank God that's over. Like, well, God planned it. Let me write out the script for you. You're going to trip over the rug at this time on this day. That's, that's what he believed. God help us. Yeah. No, what he thought is he was elite. And it applies, uh, appeals to pride. See, instead of them thinking that God knows ahead of time who should be saved, they turn it into who God wants to be saved. Right. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. If you want to know who God wants to be saved, all you got to do is ask the Word of God. Yep. 2 Peter 3, 9. Amen. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's right. All. Luke 4, 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Let me ask you. He said, Blessed is the poor in spirit. That means people that do not have what it takes to be like God. Right. They're poor. They're deficient. They can't save themselves. Whether you are elite or you are uh, destined for death, 
both of you are poor. How do you define it? Well, you have to do some theological term switching and you have to add, well, that poor there means the elite poor. It didn't say the elite poor. Amen. It said the poor. And according to the Bible, every one of us is poor. Amen. And then it goes on and he says, He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Who are the captives? All of us. And recovering sight of the blind. The Bible says very clearly in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that the whole world is blind. Amen. The whole world. Not just uh, some. And it's to set at liberty them that are bruised. That's who Jesus died for. That's who He came to save. And that's everybody. Whether you want to call yourself a lead or not, everybody started in that boat. Right. So how do you determine which is which? Well, because I'm the elite and I'm loved and they're not. Yeah. That's your pride is what that is. Right. That's your pride. So in this theological term switching, elect really means for them, when they say elect, it really means elite. Uh, when, when they say foreknowledge, it means predestination. The, actually, the, the word is used in the same sentence together. It has two different meanings. And then, all, the word all in the Bible doesn't mean all. It becomes many. It becomes many. Or through commentary, they have to add the word elect or chosen to it. Let me give you an example. Go with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and, and I hear this all the time. All right. In verse 19, it says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Boy, a lot of times, see many there. There's many. There's many that are predestined to salvation, many that are predestined to destruction. Well, if it's one man's disobedience, well, that's Adam, because the whole chapter is talking about Adam. Um, then who were the ones made sinners? All. Yeah. And so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. <laughs> Stupid. It doesn't make sense. Right. You see, it doesn't make sense at all nope. with their thinking. And then to really make it easy, just look at verse 18 and let's put it together. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. All he's doing is giving an example here. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now, how hard is that? Amen. But Protestant commentaries uh, are used with these verses that context makes perfect sense. and But you have to go to a Protestant commentary to get the deeper, fuller meaning. Amen. Well, listen, the dispensationalists do that all the time. But they still can't answer one question. Where's the scripture that says Jesus comes before the tribulation? Right. They can't answer that question. Nope. Okay, it's just like the Calvinists. You've got to do a lot of theological uh, term switching. You've got to jump through hoops. You've got to do what we call uh, scriptural or spiritual acrobatics yes. to try to make your pretense fit into our blessed King James Bible. But it doesn't. I want to tell you something. We don't need commentaries. That's right. We don't need them at all. The Bible's all we need. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, uh, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what we live by. Amen. If you'll start living by the word of God instead of saying, Well, God sometimes works outside of means and putting yourself over in oblivion where you can interpret anything you want. Right. 
Come back to the Word of God. Let it do the interpretation for you. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. Yes. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. There you go. You, you want to be elect? You want to be chosen? You want to be protected? You want to persevere? It's through the Word of God where He's a shield unto you. Amen? But then he says, Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Amen. Let me tell you what happens to liars. They end up in the lake of fire. That's right. All of them. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, yes. truly furnished unto all good works. Everything we could ever do for Jesus is right here in the Word of God. It will perfect us. The Amen. Word of God perfects us. Amen. We don't need to go into oblivion and try to figure out what God's doing. That's the mind of God. His ways are above our ways. I'm going to tell you something. His dimension is way different than ours. Amen. Amen. And if it's not written in the Word of God, leave it alone. That's good. Just leave it alone. So, as you can see, the theological term switching, elect really means elite, foreknowledge becomes predestination. The word all becomes many, or they try to add the thought of the elect when it says all, yeah. all the elect. But I've got a couple of practical objections as well. Like number one, Calvinism leaves people in doubt. When you ask someone, are you the elect? And how do you know for certain you are the elect? Chosen from the foundation of the world that God would love you and send His Son for you and you would be with God in heaven. How do you know that? <coughs> well, I believe in Jesus. The devils believe and tremble. That's right. How do you know you're in the elect. Calvinism takes the approach, again, of that which is mysterious instead of that which is practical from the Word of God. Instead of seeing that all who repent and trust Christ are saved, they see you have to be regenerate in order to repent. Which, to me, if I'm regenerate, why would I ever need to repent? I'm a, I'm a new person. Why would I ever need repentance and faith? Doesn't right. it come with regeneration? I had one guy say, well, salvation is not a, a long work. Salvation is instant and uh, you have to be saved in order to understand repentance. And I said, wow, so you're telling me that when God does something, it's in an instant. It never takes time. And he says, yeah. And I said, what about creation? Right. Took six days. And God even rested. Yeah. You know, we think we know so much about God. It took him six days to create. What about the new creation? I wonder how long that took. You know, God was drawing me a long time before I finally got saved. Amen. Amen. He was drawing me and I was sitting there objecting and arguing with God. I did not want to submit to that righteousness. I wanted to go on as I was. How do you know you're in the elect? The Bible says in 1, in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. He wrote it and said, listen, if you've been through, and by the way, belief means you've repented. Amen. God's brought you through repentance, through His Spirit. And I can say today, ye that believe in the Word of God, this thing is written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. That's how I know I have eternal life. The Word of God tells me. Amen. And that I may believe on the name of the Son of God. Just right. keep on going. It says nothing in that verse. You can know if you're part of the elect because... Fill in the blank. There is no answer to it. It leaves you hanging. It leaves you in doubt. I'm going to tell you what's happened. We've known personally people that are Calvinists. And it does one or two things to them usually. Not all the time. People can get saved out of this mess. It either hardens their heart because after all, you know, I guess, uh, I guess maybe I'm not, I'm the elite and you're not going to tell me different. And they get their heart hardened. 
or it'll lead one into despair where I guess I'm never, I'm not part of the elect. We've known people like that. They want to be saved, but they know they're not part of the elect. And whether your heart gets hard or it gets disparate, both are difficult to overcome for salvation. Extremely difficult. You get in despair of life, it is hard to show someone the gospel. You get hard-hearted, it is hard to show someone the gospel. So it leaves people in doubt. Another practical objection I have is that I believe that it's totally hypocritical. Just about every Calvinist I've ever met lives just like the world, even though they're the choice of God. I mean, think about this, Presbyterians, and that's where Calvinism... Well, it actually got its start from uh, Augustine. If you're educated, it's Augustine. Anyway, it got, his, got it from Augustine, who ultimately, though the Catholic religion did not officially exist at that time, he was a Catholic. Okay? And a man over a thousand years later by the name of John Calvin took some of Augustine's teachings and made... Um, made it his own, and now he has his own teachings, and they call it Calvinism, after a man by the name of John Calvin. He became, uh, the movement became what is called Presbyterianism. Amen, or Presbytery. Uh, You notice when you see Presbyterian churches, they call themselves the Reform, this or that. Amen. These Presbyterians sprinkle their babies. And the covenant is that they will be in the elect. So that God knew, God knew that when that you would first of all be loved and then all your children that you sprinkle in. Because why would you do that? Well, because you love God. You're part of the elect. So you're going to automatically sprinkle your children into the church and they are part of the elect and they can grow up and live like a bunch of dogs with fleas and die and say, you know what? They must have got saved right there at the last second before they died because after all, they're part of the elect. What a way that the devil has used to totally quench evangelism in Calvinistic families. You can't have it both ways. You know, some will say, well, you know, I I believe in Calvinism and I believe you're chosen this and that. Well, then why would you tell your family about Jesus? I've had some uh, and I didn't like what Michael Pearl said in that in that article. uh, And there's people that believe this. It believes that you do not become accountable for sin till the law revives and you die. In other words, you're not accountable for what you do. You can't go to hell, I guess. But let me ask you, uh, when the Apostle Paul was on the, on the uh, road to Damascus, the law revived and he died. That's when he got saved. But you mean to tell me if he'd have died before that, just after the stoning of Stephen, he'd have been all right? You see, it's confusion. It's hypocritical. There are people that'll say, you know, we're Calvinists, and then you want to tell your family about Jesus. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? How do you know if they're chosen or not? How do you know? Why would you have children? Why would I want to have a whole passel of kids and let's say nine out of ten of them are going to burn in hell because God didn't love them? Do you see how hypocritical it is? Yeah, the, the dualism of that. So, I mean, what about liberty of conscience? What about the fact that we all get to choose and we all have liberty? When you sprinkle a baby and you make him a church member, he didn't even get to choose. I mean, just think about that. No one enters the church without choosing to. I don't care where you come from. Now we see why the pedo-baptists are the ones, and when I say pedo-baptists, that's not a denomination. Pedo, pediatric, baby baptizers. They are the ones that uh, ruled through a church state in early America. See, they, that's a problem with cults like Calvinism, is that they want to rule. 
Catholicism wants to rule. Protestantism wants to rule. Baptists are the only ones that are like, listen, stay out of the politics. Let's just try to reach people for Christ. It doesn't mean you can't vote. It doesn't mean you can't even be a politician. But it means we're not here to thrust upon other men our ideology. But these others, they certainly do, don't they? Matter of fact, you'll be banished or buried alive or drowned or tortured or punished, starved out, burned out. All these things, how hypocritical it is for someone to want to be a Calvinist and not understand the history of a Calvinist. Yeah. Amen. It's hypocritical. I mean, after all, was Adam given a choice? Genesis 2 says, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. We gave him permission. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. If God was sovereign the way they say he is, he would have never ate of it. That's right. Amen. Because God is sovereign and he said, Thou shalt not. That's right. But Adam did it anyway. He had a choice. That puts the conflict in God. Do you not see that? There's no conflict in man. We love to sin. The conflict is in God. That's their view. They'll never say that. Well, that's not what I mean. Tell me what you mean. See, either Adam was given a choice or God forced the issue. It's one of the two. And if God forced that issue, then that made God the author of sin. Yes. You decide. Amen. How can one adjudicate sin if there exists a conflict of sin that lies within? How can, if I'm God, how can I send my son to be the propitiation for sin, that my anger uh, against sin, which offends my holiness, would be carried out on the son, and yet the man who is the offense uh, gets, gets the privilege of having his sin washed away through the blood and thereby I am assuaged uh, because of my holiness concerning wrath of sin. How is that if the sin lies in me? So that means Christ that was brought out of me is also the uh, author of sin. How did He become the perfect sacrifice? You see, when, when you think it through... Yeah. It just totally gets ridiculous. Yep. But most people don't think things through. Most people don't read their Bibles. They're members of churches, praise God, and they don't read their Bibles. They get preached to every Sunday, and they don't understand what the preacher said, but they just go, well, you know, our preacher, bless the Lord. Yep. That's crazy. We're to know what's preached and understand it and to see if I'm teaching you the truth or not. What becomes the meaning of propitiation? or atonement, if God was the author of the sin anyway. What hope is there for someone? Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It doesn't say whosoever of the elect. It says whosoever will. Now, let me just say something before I close. Arminianism is just as wicked. Yeah. They have a whosoever will and there's no repentance. Or they just change it, repentance entirely. You know, last night, if I'd have just said repent and didn't clarify what the Bible says about it, they would have all thought, well, change your ways. We all say that. Hey, where are you going? To hell if I don't change my ways. You ever come back with that? That's what they think about repentance is that, well, you just change your ways. But an Arminianist also loses their salvation. They, they gain it at their will. They lose it at their will. I want to tell you something. If you think that you can come to Christ naturally by choice, you've got a serious problem. Because our text revealed to us the will of man. And that is they despise Christ. The will of man is to despise righteousness. You're the very opposite. Again, you're in oblivion, just like the Calvinists. 
The worst part is that Baptist people, so-called by name, they mix with both positions. They mix. You'll find free will Baptists. Did you know that they're not Baptists at all? They're Protestants. But did you know that they, uh, you can lose your salvation because they're Arminianists? I want to tell you what this has all produced for Baptists. A bunch of congregations of goats is what this has produced. Yeah. The whole thing here is that the Spirit of God, the Bible says that the Comforter, when He has come, in John 16 and verse 8, says He will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Everybody thinks, well, the Spirit showed me this. The Spirit showed me that. When did He reprove you of your sin? That's what I want to know. Because if you've not gone through that crisis of the soul, you don't know what repentance is. Man. You don't know what salvation is. But having gone through it, I can tell you what it's all about. I didn't like it. I didn't like uh, Jeff Alverson preaching and him being right and me being wrong. I did not like it. But the Holy Ghost of God took those gospel meetings, took the Word of God, examined my heart, turned the lights on, showed me how wicked I was. I tried to run. I tried to get out of it every way I could. This was not pleasurable. This was not your best life now. This was God showing me how wicked I was. And then naturally, I could have hardened my heart and kept running. But instead, thank God, I made a choice to go the way that God was drawing me. And it was to Christ Himself for, for salvation without me putting my hand to the wheel in any way. Just trust Him. And I know I'm saved based on the Word of God. Amen. Not based on... Oblivion, something ominous, not hoping, knowing. And there's times when I have doubts in my life, but let me tell you what I do. I go right back to the Word of God. Yep. And those doubts flee. Amen? Yep. So now you see why I didn't try to put this message all into one. God bless you. I'm going to stop right there.